I am what I am, not because America gave me opportunity. I am what I am because I have become what I am despite the suffocation that America has more often put in my path than the uh, uh, windows of opportunity. <laughs> What first impressed you about Dr. King? Could you talk about the first meeting and, and how it came about? My first meeting, Dr. King, came about uh, when he called. He was down in Montgomery, and he was on his way to New York to speak at the Abyssinia Baptist Church to a gathering of uh, ecumenical uh, leaders to talk to them the clergy here in New York. And he said that he was on his way to do that, and that while here, he was wondering if he could have the opportunity to speak with me. And uh, I welcomed that, that chance. I, I didn't know him. I was curious as to who he really was. He was this force that had all of a sudden appeared in the midst of uh, a life of racial crisis and uh, had seemed to be uh, a force that could bring something to the table that was a little different than what we were used to hearing. So when he came, I told him that uh, I would gladly meet with him if he would permit me to come to the church and listen to his speech uh, to the clergy. It was at, in the Abyssinia Baptist, which was a church uh, pastored by Adam Clayton Powell, who was a forceful uh, voice in black politics and in the black community. It was at his church. I was curious that Dr. King was, uh, here he was, two years younger than, than I, uh, and this Thing that he was to articulate was very curious to me. When I saw him, uh, I was quite surprised at how short he was. And uh, I looked at him and he just didn't fit anything I had, we, we had been used to. Here we were coming out of a life of uh, Thurgood Marshall and Paul Robeson and uh, Adam Clayton Powell, all these guys were giants uh, standing next to Dr. King, and here came this, uh, uh, this human being that just uh, eluded tradition, uh, traditional expectations. We met at the church down in the basement, and uh, in hearing him speak to the clergy, uh, I got a, an opportunity to, to be introduced to the fact that whatever I would have with him was going to be the most unusual uh, encounter I'd ever had. We spoke. Uh, he told me about uh, the conditions in the South, much of which I was familiar with. Uh, he told me about uh, what he hoped to achieve with Rosa Parks and with the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott and with the, uh, what was the dawning of the movement. I had anticipated, after talking with him, that uh, any commitment I would make to him would last maybe a couple of years at the most if we, if we worked really hard uh, trying to repair uh, race relations in this country. But nothing came as, a big, as big a surprise to me as when I discovered that a couple of years was, wasn't even a blink in terms of time and space for what was coming. But after I talked with Dr. King, I, I understood that I was in the presence of something unusual.
something unexpected. The way in which he formulated, the way in which he expressed his his uh, concerns about his right or his capacity to lead a movement, and that his overture to me and to others was in order to help him uh, have a voice in his immediate uh, uh, area of accessibility to be able to make sure that he was on the right path, uh, to make sure that he wasn't uh, missing any salient points. I'm hunting for, there was something about him that made me want to know more. I've not met anybody quite like him. His calm, his rather measured way of speaking, his utterances were quite deliberate. Uh, and the bottom line was that he wanted to know whether or not this path he was on, this journey he was taking, whether or not I'd be willing to be part of uh, his flock. I think the most important thing for me was not only an opportunity to serve a cause I'd already been committed to, uh, talking about left politics and the change of the American landscape, but uh, that somehow he went beyond that. It was not just a matter of race. It was a matter of uh, the larger humanity what was happening to the world. I decided that I would throw my lot in with his. I knew I could help him with the economics of, a, of the movement's needs, not all of it, but certainly the portion that he was carving out for himself. And uh, to the extent that I had anything to impart that might encourage him or help uh, put him in touch with areas he was not familiar with was all uh, fair game. So I hooked up. What I did not anticipate was that uh, our relationship would have lasted as long as it did or that it went as deep as it ultimately did. You had a trip to Atlanta in 1962 to Atlanta to perform with Miriam Makeba and, and others where there was controversy over segregation in, in the South. I, I, uh, do you have memories of that? Challenging the institutions of segregation in public spaces, especially in, in, in the world that I, I was a performer. And a lot of places that I worked where the fee was the most attractive, where you, in many instances, places of where the, the race issue was entrenched. No blacks could come. Uh, segregation was the, was the order, not just in the South. When I first came to work in New York, uh, the Waldorf Astoria, for instance, here was this institution of, of, of American achievement and a very exclusive uh, bourgeois uh, center. Uh, that when I signed up to perform there, uh, it, it didn't want to desegregate the Empire Room, which was the name of the, the club inside the, the hotel. So breaking down institutions of segregation was always part of my mission. When it came time to go to Atlanta, uh, the mayor uh, spoke uh, very kindly to us, welcomed us. We talked about going into the Civic Auditorium, uh, uh, that it would have to be desegregated. Uh, he responded, I'm sure with some energy on the part of the local voices, but we got uh, that city center open to us. As a matter of fact, I remember when we were performing, uh, the the, the attendants of this institution were busy taking down the for colored only signs. 
and you could see spotted around the auditorium when you stood on stage these huge patches of white space where all these signs have been taken down in time for the concert. Uh, the proceeds from that concert went to the movement. I think what most people have not been able to discern is that what you know of Dr. King or what has been revealed about Dr. King is always within the sphere of uh, profound and serious challenges to social behavior. But I don't think anyone possessed the capacity for humor, both in receiving it and responding joyously to a great story, or to his sense of appreciation for the joy, more joyous side of life. His behavior around children always fascinated me because there was an almost physical difference in his uh, behavior when he was among children. I'm talking about young children, his delight in them, his pleasure in them, his own preoccupation with his children, and his great concern about whether or not, as a parent, was he was he able to meet any of the obligations in, in, in meeting the challenges of parenthood. Nowhere was that humorous side of him more revealed or revealed as well as it was uh, in a night in 1968, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I had hosted The Tonight Show for one week. I'd been invited by Johnny Carson and NBC to do it. In the first instance, I had turned the request down because I, I admired Johnny. He was always very, very good to me and, and the most uh, embracing. But to fill that space, uh, no one can do it quite the way Johnny did it. It was something he created. It was out of his own persona that this routine emerged where in the late night hours he could take the simplest of stories and turn them into magical tales and, and, make, and find humor in everything and gave America a really important look at itself in those late night hours through his prism. And for one to step in that space, if you can't tell a joke, and if you can't bring some humor to your moment, then you're, you, all you're doing is competing with the tragedies of 7 o'clock news. So when they offered me this, and I made that plea. I said, you know, uh, I can sing some songs, I can do some things, but that's not my gig. Well, Johnny was most persuasive. He came back at me and so did sign off and NBC, and we finally ironed out how to do it. The way in which it was concluded was that I could name my own guests, and I wanted to name my own guests because I wanted to give the appearance of being intelligent. I wanted to give the appearance of knowing what the hell I'm talking about. And uh, I could only do that with people with whom I was deeply familiar, uh, who had a handle on issues of the day that would be of interest to the viewer. So when I submitted my list, Bobby Kennedy was on the list, Dr. King was on the list, Lena Horne was on the list, Will Chamberlain was on the list, Paul Newman was on the list, Sidney Poitier was a, was a really quite stunning, weak lineup. And uh, on the night that Dr. King was to appear, uh, by the time we went on air, he had not shown up. He wasn't there. So we had to make quick adjustments in the lineup, in the program, find another way to open the show. And just as uh, we were about to do that, in walked Martin, all out of breath 
and really quite disgruntled. Uh, and he went on the air and he said, uh, well, I'd like, I'd like to apologize for my lateness. He said, but uh, I'm having quite a time with the uh, transportation world. Uh, my planes are late and everything gets thrown off. And uh, I'm sorry, but the plane was late coming in from Atlanta. And uh, when I got to New York, uh, I, caught a, I caught a cab. Uh, and uh, when I got in the cab, the cab driver recognized me. And he said, oh, welcome, Dr. King. I said, well, thank you for that. And I said, what are you doing in New York? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going on the air. Uh, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm late, you know. And that's all I had to say was that I was late because this young man uh, put his foot on the gas and when he hit from the airport t towards my getting here, I really became uh, most uh, disoriented. I'd never been anything that drove as fast as he did. I, just, I finally had to tap him on the shoulder and say, uh, Young man, I want to thank you for trying to make me on time, but uh, I would rather be known as Dr. King late than be known as the late Dr. King. And uh, he said that to the audience, and he, of course it got the appropriate laughter and whatnot, which gave me the opportunity to say to him, well, do you... What do you, do you fear for your life? And then he gave us an answer that I think was uh, one of his more, more, he had so many, but this was a wonderful response. He pointed out that uh, he wasn't so much interested in the length of life as much as he was interested in the quality of life. And as long as he spent his life moving humanity forward, moving the world, trying to make it a bit of a better place than the way he found it. He would have felt his mission was well worth it. Dr. King uh, visited my home with great regularity, and he also made sure that his space was filled with the things that brought him pleasure. Uh, he had his own room, his own entrance to the apartment, and uh, there's always something at his disposal, including his favorite drink. Uh, he was not a drinker, uh, but he did take a sip every now and then, and he loved Bristol cream sherry. It was one of his delights, the sweetness of the liquor and the taste. I liked it as well. But he had a bottle that was his own, and every time he came to visit, uh, he would get his bottle of Bristol cream sherry taken off the shelf, and he'd look at the last pencil mark he put on the bottle to make sure that nobody was dipping into his brew while he was away. But Martin's uh, moments when the curtain was drawn and he was not on public display was a, a man who, I think, revealed as much in his deepest concerns about his right to do what he was doing, about the fact that he was touched by that calling in history, disturbed him because he didn't quite understand it. He referred everything to divine intervention, to divine power. It's what God has called on me to do. Well, uh, I wish God had spoke to me with as much regularity as he spoke to Martin, because maybe I could have been more like Martin than like Harry had I heard that voice more often. And a lot of times I've said to Martin, where is God now? And uh, he would look at me, he said, uh, he's taking care 
of the non-believers. We need to talk about, about Dr. King's death. There has been a lot of historical tragedies that give us time to reflect on much that has been lost to us in the cruelty of the issues of race. None more profoundly robbed me of an important part of what I thought my life would be than when Martin was murdered. His death was not just a great loss for the historical dynamic that he brought to the table, but in a deep personal sense, I lost a friend. I lost somebody who I adored, somebody who brought into my life something that will never be replicated. Uh, I often look forward to my conversations with Martin and what was done by uh, James Earl Ray I don't know that there's any, there's never any way to overcome that. It is one thing for those who invited Dr. King into their space just on the forces of what history dictated. And then there are those of us who had intimate moments with him as a person, as a brother, as a member of the family as someone you broke bread with and told stories and, and to hear Dr. King speak of his fears and his doubts was almost in many instances equally as rewarding as hearing him speak about what he knew to be uh, the history he would help create. Once he was taken out of that space, something was taken out of my life that will never be uh, fixed, will never be repeated. Uh, the loss was profound. Could you tell the story of the last time Dr. King was in the apartment? It was the Poor People's Campaign. He was on his way to Memphis. He apologized when he arrived uh, that he was so late, but he had just come from Newark where he had met with a group of uh, 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 that was following in the path of a, of, a, of a movement of young people in Newark who had threatened to burn the city down. He just said, I'm sorry. Uh, I was at a meeting in Jersey, and I tried to talk to this group of young men. I am just very saddened that, uh, that I didn't win them over. Uh, they held bent on, on violence. And uh, I am saddened by that. Uh, I think in many ways I have more in common with them than I have with anybody else. But the one thing about violence and that being so much a part of their DNA uh, uh, stops me in my tracks. And uh, he said, um, I'm afraid that uh, with all that I've spoken about with integration and with all that I've spoken about uh, the human heart and change, I am of the suspicion that uh, we are integrating, with all this talk about integration, we are integrating into a burning house. And Andy, who was present at that meeting, said, well, that's a rather, well, we all felt it was a rather bleak assessment from our leader, whom he relied on for inspiration and for, for hope and for, for leading us through this mess. For him to say we're integrating into a burning house was a rather depressing note. And then Andy said, well, uh, doctor, 
if uh, if uh, if you if your suspicion is that we're integrating into a burning house, what are we supposed to do about that? And Dr. King, uh, without much hesitation, said, "Well, Andy, we're just going to have to become firemen." And that one little statement that said it all. No matter what the condition is, we have to find the solution. And if the house is going, is burning down, we're not just going to have to let it burn. We're going to have to put it out and make America whole. How have you maintained your commitment to nonviolence through all the period when a lot of people have abandoned it? Um, uh, in the Black Power era and, and, and otherwise. Uh, is that from Dr. King or is that your own? I had not, before meeting Dr. King, ever taken the option of violence off the table as a way in which to, to bring America to a reckoning. Uh, there was no question in my mind that if it came to, after all, I was in the Second World War, i have been trained in, in all of the military culture, and uh, I knew how to use a rifle. And uh, more often than not, when people said to me, where did you serve during the Second World War? I would say I served on the Fourth Front. And the Fourth Front was the South. During my service years, as a member of the armed forces, we were brutalized because of race. Black soldiers and black servicemen had always been lynched in America even while in uniform. The harvest of death that faced Americans at the end of the Second World War was huge in this country. Hundreds of men, some in uniform, were lynched all through the South, which started this major campaign on the anti-lynch, on the anti-lynch bills of federal law. So that, in a sense, the commitment to violence was always an accepted aspect of our destiny until Martin walked into the picture. We are a minority living in the belly of the beast. And as long as the white nation persists on its racial laws and its racial uh, utterances, we are destined to ever be in a place of reaction and rebellion. I've opted not to get rid of the rage because white America doesn't permit that. It is not enough for me in my 90th year of life to have lived almost a century with a nation that seems to be perpetual uh, reconciliation. It's always redeeming itself because it has been unwilling and incapable of turning off the faucet of race hate. As long as America does not squarely deal with the issue of race and what it has meant to this nation, it will never be a joyous place to really be. We are constantly referring to the dreams and the hopes of this country. People are in perpetual clash with a system that is in many instances more cruel than people are willing to acknowledge. And uh, uh, when Dr. King chooses to go from Vietnam to the streets of Chicago, Cicero, or Selma, it's because there's a package here that represents what America is that America must deal with. And uh, I don't know how to get rid of the rage and the emptiness. Uh, I am what I am, not because America gave me opportunity. I am what I am despite the suffocation that America has more often put in my path than the uh, uh, windows of opportunity. But when Dr. King stepped in, he methodically would look at guns and look at violence and challenge those 
who would seek the gun as the solution to explain how the process would work under their vision. How would violence work in America? You're in a minority, you don't own a munitions factory, you got no access to bullets and, and dynamite. Who gonna repair these things when they break down? And who's gonna supply you with the necessary instruments of destruction? Just from a practical, tactical point of view, your argument holds no, 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 no substance. But beyond the, the foolhardiness of that, morally, uh, you cannot defeat the enemy by becoming the enemy. You have to become who we are. So I began to listen to him and look at all of the advantages of nonviolence and then concluded that uh, it in fact was the best way.